Today we will be learning about and evaluating relative afferent pupillary defects. In the assessment of the pupillary light pathway, both the direct response and the consensual response are tested. When a bright light is directed into the eye, both a direct response and a consensual response occur. If there is complete damage to the afferent pathway, no direct or consensual response will occur for the affected eye. This young normal patient shows a brisk, direct and consensual response in both eyes. The afferent pathway begins when light enters the eye. A neural response is triggered in the retina, which exits the eye through the optic nerve. Nasal retina fibers cross at the optic chiasm, while temporal fibers continue to the ipsilateral optic tract. Pupillary fibers exit in the posterior third of the optic tract and travel within the brachium of the superior colliculus to an area of the midbrain known as the pretectal nucleus. Synapse occurs and the fibers leave the pretectal region and travel to the two edinger westphal nuclei, distributing about equally to both. The efferent parasympathetic fibers exit the edinger westphal nuclei and head to the ciliary ganglion. From there, they enter the eye via the short posterior ciliary nerve and cause pupillary constriction. This pathway is evaluated using the swinging flashlight test. The patient is asked to fixate on a distance target while the practitioner swings a light from eye to eye several times rhythmically, taking care to illuminate each pupil for an equal length of time, approximately 2 to 3 seconds. This video shows a normal patient with no APD. Next, we will evaluate a patient with an abnormal pupillary response. This patient had laser surgery to correct an idiopathic retinal hemorrhage. Note the macular involvement as well as the proximity to the optic nerve. We begin with direct and consensual pupillary testing. Note that a direct and consensual response are present in both the right and left eye. This may or may not be the case when an APD is present. Next, using the swinging flashlight test, we evaluate the patient's relative afferent pupillary defect. When the light is shined into the patient's left eye, we notice brisk constriction of both the right and left pupils. However, when the light is switched over to the right eye, we notice significant dilation of both eyes. This is a significant right RAPD. Next, we will quantify the magnitude of the patient's right RAPD using neutral density filters. A neutral density filter is a filter that reduces or modifies the intensity of all wavelengths or colors of light equally. Each step up our neutral density filter increases the optical density through which light is passing prior to entering the eye. Using the same swinging flashlight test as before, we hold the neutral density filter over the patient's better eye, the eye without the defect, while we watch the patient's uncovered eye, the eye with the defect. The end point is reached when the light is shined into the uncovered eye and there is no constriction or dilation. This indicates that the magnitude of light entering both eyes is approximately equal. We were unable to reach that end point through a 2.0 optical density filter for our patient, indicating a 4 plus APD. Next we will induce a relative afferent pupillary defect on our normal patient using the same principles used to quantify the magnitude on our last patient. As we increase the magnitude of the optical density of our filters, we decrease the magnitude of the light entering the covered eye. This simulates a left relative afferent pupillary defect with increasing magnitude. The same principle can be used for reverse RAPD testing in the event that you are unable to see the pupil due to an opacity in the anterior chamber or on the cornea. Thank you for joining us today to learn about relative afferent pupillary defects. Have a great day.